All right, welcome everybody to a Common Sense Reading Series. Uh, my name is Jordan Stempelman. And uh, for those of you here for the first time, uh, this is my 11th year of hosting a Common Sense Reading Series out of, a, out of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, this is obviously the first time I've ever done this virtually. Actually, the second time. The first reading was a month ago with uh, Ad Duplan and, and Tim Early. Uh, but I want to attend to some virtual reading housekeeping before we begin. And if you could, please make sure that your microphones are muted. I believe I've set this up in the default settings uh, to mute all the participants' mics. Uh, but just in case, please make sure that your mics are off throughout the duration of the event, because this should uh, help to eliminate any type of annoying feedback. And to view a reader, click on the speaker view. This will spotlight the reader, so you won't have to stare at my face the whole time and see my reactions as uh, as Carrie or Jane are reading. And please feel free to use the reactions emoji at any point in time during the reading. Um, also, please note that tonight's reading is being recorded, so if you'd prefer to turn off your video, please feel free, although do know that I'm 99% positive based on the last reading that only myself and the readers will appear in the video because I'll switch back and forth through the spotlighting. Uh, again, as I said, this is my 11th year running a Common Sense Reading Series, and this is the second virtual reading ever. All the readings this fall and the spring will be conducted virtually. There'll be eight readings in total. Uh, November's readers will be Dianelli Antigua and Carol Pagel. So please look out for the information for the registration link and upcoming readings at my website, which is jordanstempleman.com. And you can go to the Common Sense Reading Series tab and register the event the same way you probably registered for this event. Uh, but tonight I wanna to focus in on these two incredibly luminous and gifted writers, uh, Carrie Lorig and Jane Wong. Um, first of all, uh, Carrie Lorig, and hold on one second, let me admit people who are who are coming in. Uh, let me just say, um, I first knew of Carrie Lorig's writing because of uh, Magic Helicopter Press. We're both on Magic Helicopter Press, but more importantly, uh, I can't remember what it was, and maybe Carrie remembers, but I sent Carrie some email, some question, and she wrote back this incredible response that was uh, one of the most uh, thorough and insightful and uh, thoughtful emails that, that, I, that I've ever re received, truly, ever. And, um, and I remember uh, sharing it with students at one point, saying, you know, this is how communication should function. Um, and her writing, uh, exhibits that same type of, of both intensity and sincerity. Um, her book, Nods, is something that I recommend you read. Blood, the Blood Barn is another one. Um, but uh, she is, is the real deal and is a person who I think um, um, has no, um, no daylight between her writing and, and her person. I, I came across uh, Jane's work uh, in her book, Overpour, uh, published by um, Action Books. And I taught that book in a, in a poetry studio a year or two ago. And my students were so engaged with the way that Jane um, spoke to her mother, not as a mother, but as a, as a woman and, and as a person and imagined what her mother was like before she identified with her as mother. And, and then I read her essay in Shenandoah Review, To Love a Mosquito, uh, which is just a, a, a brilliant way of, of, of wrestling with family. And I saw her Fry Museum exhibit in Seattle from afar, which uh, wrestled with the, the, the ideas of immigration and ancestral histories. And so I, I couldn't be more um, thrilled to have both of you here tonight. Um, and I know that this wouldn't have happened other than this format. So there's one of the things I always try to talk to my students about, that there's this ability now to 
have these interactions that perhaps would only be contingent upon people passing through town, let's say, or being on a reading tour. And so I'm so grateful uh, because of um, both the funding of, of uh, the KCAI, KCAI gallery and the KCAI creative writing program to be able to um, invite you all here tonight. Uh, so just know that I, I really respect your work. Um, so again, I, I really want to just say that I um, acknowledge that Carrie and Jane being here tonight are because of the KCI Gallery of Center for Contemporary Practice and the Creative Writing Program at the Kansas City Art Institute. And that please know that after both writers read tonight, there'll be a, a chance for you guys to ask questions. So about 15 minutes or so. So while the readers are reading or immediately following the reading, please feel free to type in your questions in the comment box. I'll go through these questions and present them to the readers or the readers themselves will be able to see these questions and answer them. And so keep that in mind as you're listening that you'll have the opportunity to uh, to participate and to get get reactions from the writers to your questions. So let's get started. Our first reader is Carrie Lorig. Uh, Carrie is a school psychologist and a poet. She's the author of The Pulp Versus the Throne uh, from Artifice Books and several chapbooks, including The Blood Barn, The Book of Repulsive Women, and Nods. And she is currently a, a doctoral student at the School of Psychology at Georgia State. And I will go ahead and post links to where you can find these writers' works. Uh, so please welcome Carrie Lord. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. I, I really appreciate it. And um, I am really glad that we're able to do these events during this time. I mean, it would be uh, you know, I'm putting some of the poetry things on pause a little bit while I'm doing this degree, and um, this has really enabled me to do a lot of readings and and to kind of keep that side of myself, like um, being able to communicate with that side of myself is just really important to me. Um, and also reading with Jane is really, really important to me. Um, Jane came and read in Atlanta um, for a series that I did here a few years ago now. Um, but I just feel really honored to read with her as well. Um, so I was gonna read from The Blood Barn, but I decided to read something else. Um, my second book is um, called Collection Agency, and the last part of the book is called Collection Agency. Um, and I'm gonna read two poems from that. And every poem starts with uh, the same quote, um, so, and it also has all these visual elements. So I really want, I actually, I don't see that I have sharing capacity. Cause it has a bunch of visual elements. So I'm gonna, if we can share it, I'm gonna try to do that. I'm gonna make you a host. I just made you a host and let's see if that works. Can you hear me? Yeah, you know what? I think this happened before. I might have to log back in. Okay, do that. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I know we're on a no, time. no, no. No, you're totally fine. And I made you a host, so it should work now, or I'll just okay. repeat that process. Okay, okay I'll be right log back. Off. Do it. I think hosting is so funny because it's like hot potatoes. And I'm like, I don't want it. <laughs> what? Right, exactly. <laughs> and I keep thinking, you know, like that I am not going to, you know, pull the right lever and suddenly I'll just shut the whole thing down. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. So let's see Kara's if. Uh, let's I, see if Carrie's back. I still don't have sharing oh. back. You still don't have sharing capacity? Let me let me go back and see if I actually make you. Um, it seems like that there's no way for me to, because you are the host, do you have, you obviously have host capacity. Mm -hmm. 
but I wonder why you can't share. It's okay. Um, I'm trying to think. Does anyone else know if you if you type into the because yeah it says you are now the host if, if there's anything that I could do on my end to allow you to to host I mean to 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 allow sharing capacity but I don't see anything else I can do that I know of okay I'll just. Hmm. I'm trying to think. I, again, I don't want to take up too much time. Could I just send you these two poems? Yeah. Okay. Are you, you going to email them or put them in the chat? I'll just email them really quick. Yep. Sorry. No, you're totally, this is, th listen, being with students all week, you know, for the past six weeks, this is, this is how it works. This is exactly how it works. And I think it's great. I think it allows for flexibility and for us to, you know, realize how, um, how imperfect things are and how patient we have to be. So don't worry about anything. This is totally fine. I should have sent them to you before, just in case. It's okay. It's totally fine. I'm looking at preferences to see if I can do anything here that would allow for it. But <clears throat> Again, okay. as, as I was talking to Jane when you were offline, I was afraid that I would just shut this whole damn thing off if I touched the wrong button. Okay, send it to my, my personal email then. Yeah, I sent it to your Gmail. Okay, so let's see. Let's see if I can share it. I haven't gotten it yet. Okay, two poems. I think I think it's coming in. Okay, it's one document, correct? Yep. Okay. All right. So I will. As long as you don't mind being my scroll beast. <laughs> I, will, I will be your scroll beast. Let me see if I can. So okay. So the first one is the quote: "The disappearance of women." Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, I will figure out how to be a scroll beast. <laughs> Let's see if I can figure this out. <laughs> oh, so how do I do this? Uh, if you just share the screen. Yeah, where is that though? Like I'm not seeing share screen. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> um, hold on, I should be able to, I've been on Google Meet this whole time. Let's see if I can figure share screen. Um, if it can't, it can't. But okay, but no. Let me see if I can figure this out. Um, Zoom has shared. in the Zoom tab. Um, yeah, if you institutional, I don't have an institutional account. That's true. I don't have an institutional account. So in the Zoom US tab, um. It's okay. For whatever reason, yeah, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm just, seeing, yeah, for whatever reason, I'm seeing participants stop video mute, uh, pause and stop recording chat and reactions. That seems to be all I have available to me. That's fine. Yeah. So we'll we just, may just have to listen. We just may just have to listen. Yeah. Just imagine that there is lots of pictures in the back. <laughs> <laughs> of asterisks and quotes and pictures of me in the bathroom and <laughs> uh, oh, this is great that's okay um this is perfect see how strong our imaginations are okay okay so go ahead i'm gonna mute my this poem is called uh, collection agency the disappearance of women should be interpreted not only as giving up the fight against the violence of the world, but also as a clear rejection. There is an expression in Italian whose double meaning is untranslatable. Io, 
io non si so. Literally, it means I'm not here in this place before what you're suggesting. Eilina Ferrante. Collection agency. My writing as useless or as useless as thought, as a headdress, a sharp engulfment collapsing into a stream, the doors open to the rain. Being stone, what bursts forth is interference. What bursts forth is a festival of betrayal. Being stone, I make it tell the body prophet. And this is a text message. Oh, never too angry and bitter. I did not come to poetry in order. I did not come to poetry in order to talk. I came to speak, to accept the labor of speaking, to talk. I came to speak, to accept the labor of speaking. The intensity of the reader, writing as a wound, a guest, a thief in the wound, in the wreckage. Feminization of the problem of lived time. Myung Mi Kim. I have a new habit when I talk, not when I speak. I have a new habit of asking for verification, an intensity of verification. I ask for reassurance that what's taken place was real, is real, that I did not imagine it. Worse, that I imagined something happened, totally void of the pleasure of imagining. What is it to imagine when there has been an attempt to take the possibility of dreaming from you, from other bodies, to imagine something happened, totally void of the pleasure of imagining, is to realize the potential for a festival of betrayal blooming from within to feel the possibility of dreaming leave you. Did it happen? The dark, like you, is covered in flowers. The dark did record it as that. I leave work to go somewhere else. I leave work where my body is told to hold it and hold it and hold it. I leave work as the girl possessed and eating an orange. I leave work in June, having spent two years working for a body that won't be accountable, won't apologize, or acknowledge his life isn't worth more than others. He excuses himself uncontrollably. I have a new habit when I think of reminding myself that he won't be accountable, won't apologize, or acknowledge his life isn't worth more than others. I have other evidence, but I refuse to enter it here. Ella Longpre. The cure is not magical, a form of research and a threat. It changes the poem for me. Citation, narrative, a physical means for me. I'll write a hymn again. I'll write a hymn again. I have other evidence, but I refuse to enter it here. I did not come here to talk. I came here to speak as the undying. I came here to speak. I have no singing voice, but I am singing very particular phrases while I'm writing. I came here to speak as the dead. I often have singing, sung thoughts that can only occur as the undying. I am talking to others who haven't been listened to, and I am finding this form does not account for our conversation. The personal essay requires a set of coping behaviors that ultimately impose their dysfunction on the form. Last month, I tried to write a lyric essay on abortion and ended up with a collection of vignettes in which women give each other fruit. Ella Longpre. I tried to write a poem and ended up giving each other fruit. A poem. I tried to write a poem and ended up giving each other fruit. I came here to speak to others, to create space, to create a density of failure, to create space or a density of failure with or alongside others who haven't been listened to, the undying, the unquotable, the unstoppable watch. I can't be trusted. 
I am finding this form does not account for our conversation the unspeakable watch. I came here to accept the labor of speaking, of listening to the dead, to accept the labor of giving each other fruit. The only quote there is, is the one that grows. The poems I had written were failures, but dense ones, Renee Gladman. I have other evidence, but I refuse to enter it here. I can't enter it, but it did try to take the possibility of dreaming from me. He excuses himself uncontrollably. I fucking hate secrets. I think this is the part where I address it, where I include a clear and finite date in time. What can I say? What can you say? I can't be recommended. I can't be trusted. What can I say except that reality is between us? My story, my narrative. I can, I can share it. I can't. Sometimes a memory is a tremor of resentment. He excuses himself uncontrollably. I change careers. It seems like I disappear. Poetry. I'm not here in this place before what you're suggesting. I am finding this form. Narrative does not account for our conversation. Narrative, I make it tell the body prophet. What bursts forth is interference. What bursts forth is a festival of betrayal. I did not come to poetry in order and I did not fucking disappear. The disappearance of women should be interpreted not only as giving up the fight against the violence of the world, but also as a clear rejection. There is an expression in Italian whose double meaning is untranslatable. Io non si sto. Literally, it means I'm not here in this place before what you're suggesting. Eilina Ferrante. Collection agency. The intensity of the reader, writing as a wound, a guest, a thief, in the wound, in the wreckage. Feminization of the problem of lived time, Myung Mi Kim. Does this book adhere to a surface? It doesn't adhere to a surface. Am I even a poet? It pours down. A rough form of pollen slips against your cheek. I think I'm a sick woman because I burn my cheek, because I abolish the line. It goes private. Dear L, there are textures that sit behind the world. I'm about to form what I've said before, what I've never been able to say. Before I form, I touch a poem, touch that is real and not. I thought this, I thought this would be like an essay, but in my life, I've never written prose. I thought this, I thought this writing or this poem or this length would adhere to a surface, but my life, it comes and goes, it comes and goes. It pours down a poem. Seeing this envelope with what was left of the house. My fear is that the book doesn't end. Or maybe this poem will just be long. Like I have always believed in length. I don't believe we let length speak and thus a poem. Their prints in the sand are more beautiful than ours. Their prints in the sand more than ours. What the fuck is a prophecy? I want to, or I wanted to write an essay that listens for space here or not. Your thinking and mine. Anger, a wound takes a shape, a form that isn't recitation, endless, just changing. My life, it comes and goes, it comes and goes. I want it to happen here or not. A shape, a painting, no one had taught me how to write, I want to or I wanted to write an essay, paint things 
an explanation. I want to, or I wanted to, write an essay, brutal and green, but I have created a poem, a song. I have created a poem, a song. I have no singing voice, but I sing. The spectrum is at work too. A poem, there is no word for beauty. My art is the way I establish a bond that ties me to the entire universe. Here, I became too many things. Anna Mendieta. Question, what is poetry? Why do you write it? A, I am not the person I was when this book was my beginning. I thought I would describe change, this person, as having been my choice, a consequence of time, of having spent time here writing. Who is a consequence? What is a consequence? I thought I would describe my fear that the book doesn't end as joy, because that is the type of writer I am. That is the type of life I am. I read pink flowers with no word for beauty. I am not the person I was when this book was my beginning and I did not have a choice. He excuses himself uncontrollably. I read pink flowers. I read Cecilia Vicuna and thought it collects, seen and unseen, a poem, a secret. How is a citation, something you've never read, a thing you are reading, this writing is private. This writing is public. It is a cave. It is a petty grove. It is a wish, the inexpressible. I have a new habit when I think. It is not forgiveness. It is a wish, the inexpressible. I have a new habit of reminding myself that he won't be accountable, won't apologize, or acknowledge his life isn't worth more than others. I read no, I read pink flowers with no word for beauty and recognize it's fucking freeing to the point of grief. Pink flowers, a red gladiolus. Is it a peel? Doesn't it peel? Now that I have this new habit, I think I feel some relief, a note, a long pause, length, it is color, but it is also fur, unraveling and arranged. It needed a fire to release. I burn some salt and alcohol in the backyard and scratch the dog's head. The relief, however, feels, reveals something like the unstoppable, unbearable watch, the unstoppable, unbearable wound, a form, unspeakable, unstoppable. Which is it? I've written it incorrectly so many times now. It has no name. There is a wound that is unstoppable, unbearable, because I cannot refuse to be here before what it is saying, what it cannot say. I do live with, these, with this person, these notes. I am now, but what is it to imagine? What is it to write when there has been an attempt to take the possibility of dreaming from you, from other bodies, to feel the possibility of poetry leave you, to know he excuses himself uncontrollably. I did not imagine it, but I ask myself, this person, these notes I live with or am now, if I imagined what happened, I ask this, my life, these notes, I repeat it, my life, these notes and the question. I recite it until I fall apart when it seems like the answer might be yes. To feel that you may have imagined something happened totally void of the pleasure of imagining. To feel the possibility of poetry leave you. To know he excuses himself uncontrollably. The sky is a fisherman. The sky is a hook. The sky is a citation of melting grief. The sky is wildly inappropriate. The sky is a citation of roses, a little black stage, unmetrical and fragrant, very salt winds, very clouded sentences.
Eu non si sto. Literally, it means I'm not here in this place before what you're suggesting, says Eilina Ferrante, in the kingdom of touching, nourishment, survival, extinction, bold smell, says Eilina Ferrante, in the kingdom of Audre Lord, in the kingdom of the Audre Lord questionnaire to oneself. I think, again, of the blood barn. I think trying to understand how I, the blood barn, even appear, a terrible exposure of flesh, the initiating, implicating mark of an uncontrollable narrative. I have been writing my disappearances, a terrible exposure of flesh. I am deliberately writing the transcriptions from inside me, the initiating, implicating mark of an uncontrollable narrative, a bouquet of tulips, trailing rose-like clusters. I have known this book since I was young and this sentence. Something about this writing is traitorous to all narratives that continue to be projected upon it. If I write, do I reappear? If I write, do I refuse to disappear? Or do I refuse to reappear? I think putting my hand or the center of a flower on pain. To feel the possibility of poetry leave you. To disappear before such a possibility. To reappear, reappear elsewhere. It is not forgiveness. I am the wish, the inexpressible, the one with violets on her lap goes astray. I have never been comforted by a poem. Poem, a poem. To write a poem, a poem. I have never been comforted by a poem. I am writing with fear. I am not. Is it the first time I am weak and livid, unstoppable, unbearable, unstoppable, unspeakable? Is it the first time? I've written it incorrectly so many times now. It has no name. My answer is, my first thought is that this is us, two heavy cloaked bodies in the snow, ragged lumps, their foreheads wavering in the shape, a painting, a pair of cupped hands, a layer of text, sliced or draped. My answer is my thought. My thought is a poem. My thought or the words are named, unnamed, complex forms, rhythms that exist and surround, leaping out of their category and into whatever. The layer, the text, in its most terrifying aspect. Unstoppable, unbearable, the boiling forest, it's rotated. Is it the first time? The answer is her pain has always been as private as it was public. The answer is, I did not come to poetry in order. The answer is, Myung Mi Kim saying the feminization of the problem of live time. The answer is thinking of you here. I do not write with fear, and yet I do. It's fucking freeing to the point of grief. I have never been comforted by a poem because there is no word for beauty. I have never been comforted by a poem because I found this new way to quote. I'm thinking of you here. I'm thinking of reading here of the poem as unspeakable, unstoppable, interruption, intervention, you writing poems, an employee, underestimated it. The flashes that cover the lawn don't shelter. I have never been comforted by a poem. The flashes that cover the lawn don't shelter. Yet some wondrous thing within the mess was held in the cheek, the sight of decimation. I mean, I worship hard in softer beings and space. I'm 32 and booked. I'm 32 and exaggerating. I'm 32 and too personal. I'm 32 and my slippery writing are these, this, and here. A generative dissolve into a life, unmetrical and fragrant. How does public art affect movement? And is there a possibility to create a bond between them, akin? How does public art intervene in our lives? How we react to it has strong resemblances to how we respond in our relationships. 
Gosku Kunak. How will I heal? I still cannot believe this is happening. Gosku Kunak. The sculpture was carted off. Richard Serra requested that the relationship continues. The other couldn't bear to see any remains. The dancer used the power of cutting a rhythm. They cracked open time, a dimension where no one could tackle. How will I heal? How does public art intervene in our lives? How does public art affect movement? The dancer used the power of cutting a rhythm. The other couldn't bear to see any remains. Cracking open time, a dimension where no one could watch. And yet I do. While this book was becoming, I entered a wordless state. I entered again. It is still painful and intimate, still wordless though. No, I won't survive this way. No, I won't repeat language this way because I do intend to word it, to arm her. I came to poetry to speak, a whole orchard in bloom. I wait for it and I look it. Go ahead and tell me how easy it is to say it. A poem, a story, a reading, a bloom intervenes. Yes, I continue the poem, the story, the reading, the bloom intervenes. Which is it? Cracking open time, a dimension where no one could watch. And yet, I've written it incorrectly so many times now. It has no name. It has no name for beauty. I wait for it and I look at pink flowers. Myself, I desire a prose. B, what is poetry and why do you write it? The devil inside me, the flower inside me. That's it. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. I, I tried to post just, just moments from that poem and um, I wish there was a way for, you, could, could you direct people to where they could find that, um, the transcription that you, the file that you sent me? Um, sure, I mean, I don't, I, don't I can't remember if I've published them or not, to be honest. <laughs> 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 because yeah I, I was going through and I had the I had the privilege of just of going through and seeing them on the page and seeing the the um the spatial intention that you had and the the images behind it and um so anyway I it was just it, yeah it was incredible and and if someone could you know access that as well um yeah, we can, figure, that, yeah. we can figure it out maybe whenever you send out the recording it can also come with a file with these poems that would be incredible. Yeah, absolutely. That would be I great. Don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it could be out there. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be great. That, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. All right. So our second reader is 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 Jane Wong. And and Jane's poems can be found in places um, such as the Best American Non-Required Reading, uh, American Poetry Review, Agni, Poetry, Third Coast, and others. Her essays have appeared in McSweeney's Black Warrior Review. Echo Tone, The Georgia Review, The Common and Shenandoah, and this is The Place, Women Writing About the Home. A Kudaman Fellow, she is the recipient of a Pushcart Prize and a fellowships and residencies from the U.S. Fulbright Program, Artist Trust, and Fine Arts Work Center, Willapaw Bay, Air, Hedgebrook, the Gentile Foundation, and the Mineral School. She is the author of Overpour, which I mentioned, which is just such a glorious book, uh, released from Action Books, and how Not to Be Afraid of Everything, which is forthcoming from Alice James in 2021. She's an assistant professor in creative writing at Western Washington University, and I'm thrilled to have Jane here tonight. Please welcome uh, Jane Wong. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Jordan, so much. Um, Carrie, just like, holy shit. I don't, I like, I don't know what to do right now. So um, I'm just, uh, the best I can say is I feel vibrational um, after listening to that. Um, that was, uh, I think to quote the, the piece, brutal and green. 
Um, and I was thinking a lot as you were reading, maybe at the very beginning of the piece, there was something about um, there's no such thing as being too angry or too bitter. Maybe I'm misremembering, but there's something like that. Um, and I thought I'd actually begin because of that line um, with the poem that is pretty mad and it's called Mad and it's about anger. Um, <laughs> so it actually starts off my second book. Um, so I'll read a lot from How to Not Be Afraid of Everything, but also some new shit as well. Um, can you all hear me? I always kind of am paranoid about like the internet um, and voice. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, and thanks everyone for, for being here on the interwebs. Um, this poem is called Mad, and it's kind of written um, sort of in a Mad Lib style, which is so cheesy, but I kind of liked that cheesiness about it. Old school style. I don't know if I can sort of, you can see, but okay. Um, mad, and it's a lot about that, that anger. Jane, deceived by time and again should not, but she, and slept with curled fists, the rat catching a ride on the turtle winds, ugly and coarse, but beware of strangers who, and when you're, and lick the sweat off your face and falls just to taste their own. Do not trust in owls and heads that spin. Heads should not spin nor stink like ammonia in the armpits, like a habit of. Do not pause to watch insects like dangling lights. Their soft speckled bodies and minutia of buzzing dandelion seeds have already you in the neck. Blood on their spindle tongues. This is a metaphor for, there are no wolves in his tail, only handsome with pea green eyes who will tell you, you are as soft as, then they will carefully cut and Seek only the smallest kindness of shaking out a pebble from a neighbor's shoe to do unto others what you, did you swallow? Jane called intense. Surely head spun, owl struck, stating if only she called feisty, talks to, or talks to, often too smart for, good, I never thought you'd be looking like, you have big eyes for a curiously strong or, weak, or it's just, and it's for the best. Her hair, though, is the best and is remarkably like kindling and okay for, to touch, light, and ingest in flame, strand by, ignore when she says, or this is of Jane. Jane rubs salt all over her body to become a dissolving, and thusly, rightfully so, right out of this world. Okay, um, so the next poem I'm going to be reading, and um, while Carrie was reading, I was thinking a lot about the layers of repetition that was happening in that piece. And um, this has a bit of that kind of layering too, so um, shout out to, to your piece and kind of thinking about what I'm going to be reading because I didn't prepare exactly what I was gonna read. So I, I like to hear what you, know, what you were gonna do, and I was like, oh, I'll choose as a result. Um, so, uh, kind of honoring that repetition, that layering effect. Um, this is called Everything. Um, and as I mentioned, my second book is coming out next year and the title is How to Not Be Afraid of Everything. And I felt like I had to write a poem called Everything because um, it made sense. And obviously there's, it's not a to-do manual. I offer no advice. Um, but this is called Everything. I am the type to go to bed with my feet dirty. A man calling from a balcony is not to be trusted. In 1988, the nation sings a song I can't understand, but I sing it because everyone looks at me like a thief and no one likes a thief. Algae gathers in plastic cups along the Jersey shore. The dull prongs of a fork still count as a weapon. I gather plastic cups along the shore and shake them out for use, for tea, juice, a home for my toothbrush. The Pledge of Allegiance is a building ledge, an alleged crime, a leg crossed over another leg, a plea gone askew, a glance shared in the room with someone else who looks exactly like you. Hundreds of toxic wild boars are roaming across northern Japan, and it would be a mistake to identify with them. 
1960, my grandmother holds no knife and no tall wheat. When washing her feet, my grandmother tells me she spent decades without shoes, wonders if the mud misses her. When we look at each other, we will also look away knowingly. I am a good daughter, and I can repeat this indefinitely without ever taking a breath. Often, I call out to myself just to hear an echo, to hear something moving in the walls, like a healthy family of rats. My mother has been told repeatedly, you cannot walk here. Here is a white stone, a white fence, a white seagull, a white jug of milk, a white candle, a white duvet, a white patio, a white bar of soap to wash your mouth out with. Sometimes I dream in Cantonese and I have no idea what is being said. You grow to love what you create, pouring out of your mouth. In 1988, my father sees his reflection in a rearview mirror and identifies with the blood moon lighting his way to Atlantic City. From a balcony, a man yells at me, you need some white dick, and then I turn into a boar. My father disappears for weeks and my mother keeps weeding the garden, pulling cigarettes from the splintering tomatoes I will devour. I study asymptotes for months and dream in curves, almost but never touching. My mother writes in her English diary for night school, I hate him, I hate him, I hate him, I hate him, I, and her ESL teacher gives her a check, so I give her a check plus. To be a good daughter means to carry everything with you at all times, the luggage of the past lifted to the mouth. When we look at each other, my mother laughs like an overripe tomato on the windowsill. In 1989, I spent months assembling a puzzle map of the United States of America, and the teacher said, good job, Jane. And then louder and slower, like a drowning sloth, good job, Jane. And I never touched a single piece. Bloody drunk in a blood moon, my father fights another gambler and jabs at his arm with a dull fork, and they both laugh celestially. During elementary school, I did not say a single word, even when called on, and thus the teachers and administrators decided I could not speak English because they looked at me. Mao Zedong explains math. Quote, in geometry, I just drew a picture of an egg. That was enough geometry for me. My grandfather was jailed by the Red Army sometime between 1966 and 1976, and my mother says, I saw him cry when I tried to visit. He wanted to eat the bow I made for him. Algae gathers, gleaming like a jewel on the head of my fifth grade beta fish. Counter-revolutionaries during the Cultural Revolution are likened to finding a bone inside of an egg. I was born healthy in the year of the rat. The man on the balcony invests in a foldable set of two chairs and one table in eggshell white, mold resistant and perfect for outdoor use. I was 10 when I willed a rock to fall off a ledge just by staring at it long enough. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Let's see what else I can do. Um, how much time do we have? Maybe I can read like one more. Whatever. Absolutely. Re yeah, totally read as much as you want here. I mean, we can we can extend questions or whatever later. It doesn't matter. Keep reading, please. Thanks, Jordan. Um, maybe I'll just read one more that's a bit of a kind of a longer piece um, and I'll kind of end there. This is a newer one. Um, and I recently read it, and I kind of wish I could do it again. Um, I recently read it um, for UW Bothell's um, Convergence on Poetics. And I actually uh, cooked this poem. <laughs> uh, I literally cut out some of the, the words in rice paper, and then I folded them into dumplings, and then I ate them. Um, and so like, whenever I now kind of am rereading this poem, I can't help but like literally taste dumplings. <laughs> So um, yeah, when you're sharing this this video again, I'm sure I have I have some photos of the event that maybe I can also share with you. But 
I'll just end with with this poem. It's called The Long Labors. Um, and, you know, I think in all of the poems I, I read, it has a lot of like, I don't know, matrilineal lineage in here. And my mom is a postal worker. Um, and so as you can imagine, the, the mail is like swamped right now. Um, but, you know, send in your ballots early, do the thing. Um, your postal workers love you. Um, okay, this is called The Long Labors. And thank again, thanks again for listening. My grandmother said it was going to be long, as long as you can hold your lineage, depending on how long you can hold your tongue, as long as your tongue can wrap around the pit of some stolen stone fruit, as long as you can hide your pitter-patter face glued in sun-split splinters, lengthening shadows as long as your face, longing to be mirrored back, back to your daughter, your mother, your grandmother, freckle by freckle, furnished forever across the long, loaming hall. Collapsed in a pool of spit, my mouth over papers, raccoon doctorate, luxurious loser with thin branched fingers, no meat in the palm, no muscle in the bending. The farmer in me is atrophying. The cook, the factory seamstress, the clerk, the mother in me is spooling out. All that I come from, all that I owe to them. What is left of me, professorial rat? book leavened and maddened in meetings, chewing at my desk on a frozen anything, microwave spun and splattered on lessons, who wondering who packaged this, who spooned this glacial sauce into this plastic hull, whose daughter, whose hands, does she look like me, does she like dancing in the gloaming, funneled into my greedy mouth, I, and the daughter of long laborers. I knock off half price guilt. I impossible imposter, these big words trying to prove what and to whom. I wait to be seated at a restaurant. A white person enters and then starts ordering from me. I want sweet and sour chicken, but without bell peppers and brown rice, and I almost take it down. In the 12th hour of night shift overtime, my mother gobbles the air of the facility, mouth opening a cavern or a bowhead whale or a sinkhole, gobbling up all its oxygen, its nitrogen, its argon, its skin, its hair dust, its swirling pink smog, collecting time, collecting benefits. Her eyes are so baggy they carry a leaking pack of chicken breasts that she had planned to cook tonight for us. But look at the break room clock. She is out of time now. They will surely go bad. What a waste with a dollar fifty a pound. She returns to her station, rubs tiger balm and lavender oil along her wrists and hands, and she chews dried ginger to keep awake. The root of herself sharpening, salivating, reapplies pink lipstick, swirls the tube upwards, rituals of resilience, feeds letters to machines, churning intestinal noise, electricity bills, and love letters, and baby photos, and magazines, and credit card limited time offers, and reminders from the dentist, and supermark weeklies, and postcards from Oahu. You wouldn't believe how blue the water, how restful, how peaceful. Bring the whole family next time. Time. Ginger chew, ginger chew, ginger chew. Who made this for you? Do you know the song that reminds them of home? Do you know how to play the radio as loud as you can and roll down the windows and smack your cheeks 10 times in order to stay awake for the drive? Do you know who sewed on this button? Do you know the murmuring leg ache from standing all day a tree for whom? Do you know who processed this letter that you received today, fed it into a machine with paper cuts as wide as a river you could float in? Do you know how long you can hold your urine until you're 15, the roiling pressure in the abdomen, how much to tip the gas attendant in Jersey, how the smell sticks behind earlobes, the temperature when flipping a walk, the oil, the burns, the white papered hat measuring salt to the brim, how your impatient face resembles a slowly rotting peach? Worms in a snarl? Do you know the name of your fishmonger? The name of my uncle? The times he has snuck in a call to say he will be late picking up his daughter today? Fish scales glitter to the elbows like opera gloves? Do you know the cuticles peeling white like flecks of cod after washing dishes? Do you know the smell of nail polish remover stinging bees in your nostrils? Do you know the back? How the back curls? How the back bridges? How the back puckers, crunches, like packed snow, no one else but you shovel out. I look up how labor is used in a sentence. The obvious labor. Immigrants provided a cheap source of labor. Negotiations between labor and management. 
Once the vote of labor in the elections, the flood destroyed the labor of years. All these words, capitalism, gentrification, what do these words mean and to whom? Helping my mother over the sink, I sniff the ends of long beans with kitchen shears. The ends roll away, little green lizard tails. I cut away each word like a long bean, gentrific, gentrif gent G juggling, guggling down the drain, if only lying on the beach. If only limbs loosened like an old garden hose. If only watching the movements of our stomachs rising and falling like baby jellyfish. If only reading a book, the pages wrinkled and curled like a snail shell. If only devouring a cloud full of rain and no metallic muscle. If only softness. If only we could go into that softness, into the downy, relaxing abyss. What is this word? Vacation, my grandmother asks me, chili oil hitting the water like delicious dying stars. Look, my grandmother said it was going to be long. Going out the door, always late for work, shirt inside out and go, go bounce a howling baby while skimming oxtail broth, the fat sheen of look how well we eat in this country, lest you forget it was worth it, lest you forget the dilation of the cervix, the contractions going, the grip, the placenta, the shit, the vernix, the garbled life going, the flashlight eyes, the milk, the teeth, the nails, the hand on heart, the soup coagulating on the stove, you must go. For what gleams in the dark turns to look at you. Remember this. Remember the work and the after work and the work of being perceived as not doing enough work, though you are working well over enough. Will this ever be enough? When is enough enough to chorus now? Not until the knots of fat melt in this walk. Not until you have nothing left but this suet. This smear of high heat lineage gleaming in the gloaming and it is yours and it is mine and it is your dream daughters and it will last longer than you will ever believe, believe us. And that's, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to drink water now. Drink your water. Thank you so much, Jane. That was, that was beautiful. That was really amazing. I, I want to open up questions to anyone who has any questions. Again, we're not going to get kicked out of this club. So don't worry about a time frame here. I want to give everyone a chance to respond and ask the writers any questions they may have. Um, maybe while you're, while you're thinking about those things, I know I just have a general question for both of you, given that I know I, I, selfishly I'm affected by um, the idea perhaps of, of writing in this new, new form of, of whatever uh, we call uh, the constraint of the epidemic is, or the pandemic. Um, I think of Alexander Chi's essay that I had my students read in, in first year seminar uh, on becoming an American writer, which, uh, you know, how do we respond to annihilation? How do we respond to a sense of hopelessness? How do we respond to something um, that we, maybe didn't prepare ourselves for and now we're in and and that's one question i have for you all is is um how have you responded in writing to um to the pandemic and however you you can think about that question but what what has that done for you and and your writing i know for me it's it's produced less writing and more um more watching but I would love to hear from you all. How have you responded to this new situation? And feel free to go first, Jane, and then and then Carrie. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I think that I certainly haven't been writing. I think that the weird thing that happened to me, and maybe this is a kind of writing because it's, um, <laughs> it's kind of like in my blood, I, I guess, whatever that means, is that I've been cooking and uh, I grew up in a restaurant, I'm a restaurant baby, um, like a really shitty Chinese American takeout restaurant. We never actually ate the food we cooked um, because it was like, you know, like crab rangoon or whatever that is. Um, but uh, because I was like fed my whole life and um, surrounded by people who cooked. I actually never cooked and I was always like scooted out of the kitchen. Um, so this is like the first time in my life where I'm actually cooking um, fully all the time and making the most like 
you know, like the comfort food of your childhood. And in a weird way, I mean, I was thinking back to, you know, like, you know, Carrie's piece and this, like, what is a poem? Like, why do you write poetry? And like, I'm just like staring at this, like, you know, goopy blob of like rice soup, like jok. And it's like, I, I don't know, there's something about it, like simmering and it makes these like goopy sounds kind of like mud. Um, and I'm just looking at it and just kind of like, well, why isn't that a poem, I guess? Or like, I don't know, that's where I'm at these days. It's like, just trying, trying to like learn to cook. And maybe that's a type of, um, a deeper way of like thinking about writing that I don't know, maybe I'll be writing lots in like two years from now, but right now I, I'm like paralyzed by that, um, you know, ability to, to write anything, but, or just like, whatever I, I yeah watching is interesting I've been watching a lot of television um but I'll pause there but um yeah yeah, yeah. no 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 I think about and it wasn't it wasn't Ada Limon who said this I think she was quoting from another writer who I'm forgetting um where she said she I, but I swear to god she wrote an essay about writing through not writing do you guys remember that? And 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 she said something in the effect of, you know, that it's this type of attention that we do within the poem that we can translate into just the type of attention through any other type of daily act. And that is practice in itself. I, I can't, I wish I could remember the exact essay that she wrote. And I think she was quoting from another poet. Um, but that struck, um, that struck something with me that that really stayed and, and reminded me that that um, there is a quality to attention that is present in the poem that can be present outside the poem. And sometimes I think that's more important. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes I think that the, the, the idea of um, preservation within the poem is, uh, it can be a trinket of sorts, or, or it's, it's something different that it's not as applicable to, to, to me and those around me, um, that, that that type of attention is what I'm trying to replicate outside of the poem and that I'm experiencing within the poem. And I think maybe that's, I don't know, it's something that, that maybe this can speak to this type of moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Totally, I'm totally. To find yeah. the that sounds like, I don't know if I've read that, but I've got to find that. <laughs> yeah, Ada Limon wrote it, I think it was a poetry. And anyway, I don't know. Carrie, do you, do you remember that? Or do you want to speak to? I don't, I don't, but um, I mean, it sounds like the type of thing that I would like or think about. I mean, it's hard for me because like I said, so I started this program and I knew it would be like the first three or four years that I just wouldn't be able to write poetry. Probably. I still keep a document like where I put things, but I also like, I don't, I don't know why, but I feel like as I've gotten as, I don't know, I just feel less anxious about that. I'm more like, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that I'm like, I'm never going to stop writing poetry. And I know that I'm going to find ways to, to make it happen for me. And I also like, I'm doing all of my work as a psychologist really centers on trauma and addressing trauma in educational settings. So I still feel like I'm collecting all the information that I'm interested in. Um, like right now I'm, I'm working on putting together a qualitative research study. So I'm doing interviews with teachers kind of about their experiences with trauma and their experiences supporting students who've experienced trauma. So I, I do, I just feel like there is a lot of work to do right now. And I, I think like Jane, I, I just am always thinking about other things that can be part of the poem or how I might bring some of these, I, you know, I think people can probably tell from what I read too, is that I'm always thinking about how to include parts in my poem that I'm not supposed to include um, or use them as ways to kind of like move the poem forward or to kind of create some complexity in the poem. And so I'm, I'm really interested to see what will happen to me is kind of how I feel about it. Um, and I also like, I mean, Jane, when you were talking about the dumplings too and and those kind of somatic rituals, I think we're kind of all <laughs> experiencing so much somatic shit <laughs> and it's all in our bodies and we're going to have to like reckon with that, I think. And it's, I'm, I'm kind of 
I really feel it so much in my body lately. And I'm, I'm thinking a lot about how, what I might do with it and, and how I might bring some of that somatic thought and poetry thought around trauma into some of my work as a psychologist as well. So that's a very convoluted answer, but everything, no, I, I don't think it, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think it's convoluted at all. I think, I think what you're talking about is this idea of like witnessing and how do we, um, how do we allow for the witness to come out mm -hmm. into the world? And I think language is a, is, is a really fundamental component of allowing for trauma to escape the body and to perform as witness or to, to express itself as, as saying that this is, this is outside and, and I'm witnessing and other people can witness as well um, instead of the eternal um, kind of grief or, or shame mm -hmm. that, that comes at the body and stays within the body. So no, I think mm -hmm. that's, you know, um yeah i don't know i mean i i think that's the one thing that allows um and then i think about writing itself as being something that we think of as this um you know lexicographical you know transmission where oftentimes it's also thought i think writing can be thought as long as there's a transmission outward and i don't know oftentimes um how to express or define that transmission outward other than through speaking or writing, but I know there's other ways. I know there's other ways. Um, gesture, certain gestures perhaps. I don't know if they're as effective or not as, as maybe those other two for me, but um, I think there's other ways. So no, I think that makes total sense. Uh, do, does anyone else have any questions um, directly to, to Carrie or Jane um, about, Anything that they've written or any questions you have about writing in general or about what you heard tonight? And you can go ahead and put those in the chat. And if not, I don't want to put any um, pressure on anyone. I just always want to give the, the opportunity for people to, to participate in that way. And I'll, I'll account for it. Um, okay. Um, a question from Nan, uh, Carrie, do you work a lot with repetition in poetry? And I would say, yeah, maybe talking about, you know, this idea of, uh, what do we call it, anaphora in poetry, yeah. you know, kind of going back to the repetition and what it does for you mm -hmm. or what, how, how you use it and why. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, it is a great question. And I, I've always been really drawn to repetition. Um, I think partially because I like really struggled with like meter. I just, I always felt like I kind of had my own rhythms and I really wanted to understand them. And so I would use repetition a lot to kind of help myself hear things and to hear them become different <laughs> each time I said them. I think even Gertrude Stein, like I became really obsessed with this thing that she talks about with repetition that each time you say it, it becomes this different thing and it extends and I'm so interested in that. And I particularly in this last section of my book and in those poems I read, I quote from my previous book that I wrote and I was like, can I do this? And then I was like, I can do it. <laughs> so I think I'm just always interested in like what happens when you take the words and put them somewhere else. And I also end up thinking a lot about repetition and quoting alongside each other because I think we quote things a lot and you know, it's, it's like even just the way that like on Instagram, we're like obsessed with quoting and on Twitter, we're obsessed with quoting. And I think it's like really amazing. And I'm also just really interested in what happens when we like rip the quote out from the writing and, and also like what happens when you like take a quote and then build all these things around it. I'm just, I'm so interested in it just because I often think of quoting as this like this thing you do to sound really smart. Sometimes that's how I'd always think of it in school. I feel like people were, were quoting to like somehow be like, don't you get it? <laughs> it's here in the quote. And, and sometimes I wanna know about the life of, of the quote to this particular person. And I, I want that tenderness in it and I want that experience. And sometimes I feel like repetition just it distorts it, it gives it, it's, it gives it the life it deserves. <laughs> and it also just creates all this interesting tension that I just like for the life of me cannot get over. 
Yeah, I think about it as the 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 like almost like a frequency of the response or something. You know, you 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 have the call, which is the quote, and then you have the frequency of the response, which is the repetition and how mm -hmm. it can build on itself and can can allow for um, uh, the depth the depth of 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 the response mm -hmm. to the quote. Not not just saying this stands for me or or kind of writing on the back of the quote, like you said, like a a pretentiousness, for sure. Rhett, Rhett had a question off of Nan's question, which is, are there any um, specific music artists that inspire that type of repetition? Um, I mean, I, I always make really specific playlists for every poem that I write, and I listen to them obsessively while I write the poem. And so I'm wondering if you're saying that because there was a musical quote in that poem. <laughs> but yeah, I do. I really, like I said, like I'm, repetition feels really close to rhythm for me and i'm so i'm so intoxicated by rhythm and i also am like really frustrated with myself i really wish i could just like i could just like write the rhythms i was taught to write in in school but i just can't do it <laughs> right but I'm, but i'm always like trying to get back there <laughs> and music i think there's there's just so many the pulses of music just really activates a lot of things for me while I'm writing and I don't read out loud while I write I just kind of sit inside of it um which probably I feel like that sounds a little a little wild but I the music really does help me feel through that for sure yeah um, another question, I'll come back to B's question um, from Tyler. Jane, you mentioned you've been watching a lot of TV and Carrie, I'm sure you must be constantly reading for school. Um, could you all talk about how your reading habits have changed or not in general over the past few months and anything good that you've read recently? Uh, Jane, you want to start and then Carrie and then we'll come back to B's question. Yeah, um, yeah, I love this question because I've, I've been watching so much television. <laughs> Like, uh, and there's so much actually such trash television and such good TV right now. Um, but um, I'm just thinking back to kind of what Carrie was talking about, like process too, and like um, ways of writing. And I've done this thing recently, um, and this will link to this, this, this question and answer, um, where since I've been working on nonfiction or, you know, whatever an essay means to me, but I'll record myself reading a full draft of it on my phone and then I'll play it while I'm chopping vegetables, like it's a podcast, um, which is really weird to hear yourself read in the background, but it helps me actually revise because I, I can hear when things are like off or I need more information from that scene. So anyway, I was just thinking about different ways of processing, um, which is kind of you know an answer to this, which is like my attention span is so terrible these days. Um, and so maybe that's why the, this podcast or like my voice in the back is like okay to me right now. Um, but I, my reading habits have changed a lot now, mostly because I've been finding myself returning to books more so than reading newer work. Um, though there's so many, so many great books have, that have been released during this quarantine period. Um, and I have them all, like all like, you know, I bought them cause like I like, actually have a job which is like incredible and so grateful for that to be able to buy these books um, and support these writers um, so I have this like stack of all these brand new books um, but I keep going back to ones that I think offer me a sense of comfort or have added to like my literary um, you know lineage over time and so I recently um, and a lot of that is what I'm teaching right now so I'm teaching a graduate class right now on hybrid form and you know to to return to Teresa Hakan Chao's dictate like again and again and again but reading it out of it's not meant to be read in order anyway but to read whichever passages that um stay with me over the years like going straight into that like a um, like a, a particular passage and then moving elsewhere and so I think my reading these days is kind of very fragmentary um, and hopeful. Like I feel like I'm gonna make it to these new books <laughs> and I'll read like little bits and pieces and I'll put it down and read some new, like someone, someone else's book and put that down. So that's where my brain is right now. I can't really um, kind of like sit down and read something in its full entirety, which is weird, um, a weird feeling because it's not like some, that's something I usually do because I love long, especially long work. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers the, your question, um, Tyler, but, um, 
Yeah, just, I mean, I just watched this one trash show on Netflix called Trinkets. Um, I don't, it's not that trashy. It's actually pretty good. But anyway, it's, it was like, I used to steal as a teenager when I was like 16 or so. And I saw that these teenagers were like, like shoplifting. And I was like, I'm going to watch that show. So, and I'm actually working on an essay about stealing right now. So I think that that was really, I mean, it's all tied. It's all, I mean, it's all connected somehow. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. You're, you're at least watching things about what you did in your past. I'm just watching like uh, Married at First Sight and um, that show about how people <laughs> shouldn't be together. Um, Carrie, anything about your reading habits that have changed? Or Yeah, I yeah. wish I, I almost wish I could say that they had, but I, the demands of my program, like they're just pretending. It's really interesting to be in a counseling and psychology right now because I kind of and this is not a knock against my school but also a little bit and that like I kind of feel like they're just pretending the pandemic is not happening <laughs> and they're just like we're go we're going forward we're just going we're going forward you're going forward here's a bunch of shit to read so I read it um and sometimes it's helpful like I almost have an out-of-body experience where I'm like Look at me do all these things. <laughs> How's that happening? But at the same time, it it does help, I think, because I'm I'm kind of I'm lucky I'm at a point in my program where I'm getting to kind of do the things that I want to do. So I've just been reading a lot of kind of articles about about trauma, and I'm like writing an article right now um, for an international journal kind of trying to think about trauma and culture and you know just I, I have a lot of things that I have to read and it's it is really hard to concentrate it's really hard to kind of I feel like my body's revolting against it at times and then other times I feel like I'm able to kind of look at things from a new perspective and I'm really grateful for that I also feel like I'm also working in schools right now, so I do feel really grateful to kind of like have firsthand um, experiences with students and being able to read things to kind of help negotiate some of some of that right now. Um, but I do like I try I, I'm also doing the same thing that Jane's doing. I just keep buying poetry books and just keep thinking I'll get to read these soon. Um, and they are it's like really poetry is really funny because I feel like just the tangible books in a the books are really comforting to me. <laughs> Just having them. Yeah, because yeah, because the, they'll stay as they are in many ways. I think that's the thing, right? I mean, as as horrible as Ezra Pound was, I mean, the, the idea of poetry is news that stays news is true. You know, it's it's what's in them doesn't doesn't um, deteriorate. Like not going through your your CNN feed would become outdated in yeah. some way, right? Poetry doesn't believe right. in time, really. <laughs> no, it doesn't, right. Poetry doesn't believe in time in the same way of, of that getting the story out. It's not about getting the story out in that way, totally. Um, Nan, you had a question for Jane. Um, you said, I noticed a connection to rats in the poems you read for us. And I especially love the imagined healthy rat family in the wall keeping you company. Besides your birth year, where does this connection to rats come from and where has it led you? Oh my gosh, yeah, rats. Um, yeah, I have, I feel, I love rats and I love raccoons in particular and they show up a lot, I think, in my poems. Um, yeah, so obviously I'm born in the year of the rat, but uh, to be honest, like, I, I mean, I grew up in a, in a takeout restaurant. I am no stranger to rats. Every restaurant has rats in it. I just want to emphasize the fanciest places, the hole in the walls, there are rats um, because rats are survivors. They will find any little crevice to make a home in. Um, and they will fight you and they will, as you probably know via Pizza Rat in New York City, um, they, you know, they've got good taste too. I mean, I just recently, um, for the first time, watched Ratatouille. Uh, which is an amazing movie actually and i made Rat ratatouille while watching this movie um, about this chef rat and there's just something i love about rats i think that they're just such um incredibly smart creatures super loyal as well 
um, and just fighters. And so I'm just drawn to rats um, and, and raccoons, I think, in a similar way. Um, but yeah, they show up a lot, I think. Um, I'm noticing, it's weird too, because I, I, I mean, when you're writing things, you don't really mean to add certain things in there but i feel like rats slugs raccoons are like the what the three mushrooms maybe that kind of keep showing up um and i think it's just because they they have this kind of um yeah like fungal quality like they just won't stop multiplying and going for it despite the fact that everybody's trying to like um you know kill them or like think of them as like terrible sinister creatures um when they're just trying to live um and so yeah I, I just love rats I just yeah they show up a lot um and I love the healthy family of rats in the wall it's just kind of you know somebody somebody is is doing okay <laughs> um you can hear them you know moving around um yeah I grew up also with like lots of weird creatures um the first house I grew up in or rather apartment attic I guess like um my mom my, my mom my dad and I slept in the attic or that was like where we lived and the squirrels um when I was a baby my mom would tell me about the squirrels that were running across the rafters like as we we're sleeping I just love that image of the crazy squirrels just like living with the squirrels in this attic space uh I'm sure there are rats too but um yeah into the rats yeah and anyone who knows that experience when you're in an apartment or a house with animals running through it, it feels like they're in your head while you're sleeping. Yeah, totally. I went, right? Yeah, I once had like a raccoon stuck in the crawl space and it sounded like it was in my brain, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's a very intense, close feeling. There's another question that, and maybe we can end here, you know, Carrie had a question for you, um, Jane, which was um, talking about, yeah, the goat in the attic from Mary Rufel, exactly. From, from yeah. yeah, we, I, you know, students, uh, Maria's in, in my first year seminar and we read uh, Mary Rufel's essay about imagination uh, referring to uh, Emily Dickinson's Goat in the Attic. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so Carrie has a question for you. I would also love to hear you, Jane, talk about how you negotiate humor in your poetry. It feels like it's folded into this type of intensity and darkness, but it also feels like it creates this really interesting space in the poems, um, like a pause or a breath or something more complicated than that. So what? how are you using poetry to maybe navigate the the tempo or the tone of your poetry, it sounds like. And I think that's a really important, yeah, aspect of your work. And I'm interested in that answer too. Yeah, thanks Jordan, thanks Carrie too. And I'm curious too, um, how you kind of think through that question yourself, Carrie, um, especially thinking about like tonal shifts that happen. Um, I don't know, you know, for a long time, and you know, I wouldn't say Overport is a funny book. Um, and I think I, in that book in particular, th there may be moments where people can chuckle, um, kind of like, the, I don't know, maybe there's this, I think there's that one line about something about, uh, you know, not being able to pay back one's loans, right? Or with like, you have to pay them da dandelions or something. I don't, I also don't remember what I wrote, what I wrote <laughs> a long time ago, but um, I feel like I'm a goofball in real life and uh, kind of a, I make bad jokes all the time. And I think for me, allowing myself to be funny in poems was a really hard thing to do actually. Um, because I, for a long time, you know, thinking about even what you're saying about quotes having this kind of hoity-toity kind of presence, I always thought in a poem, like if I'm going to talk about things like intergenerational trauma, like I can't throw in a joke about like a teacher like saying like, you know, um, good job, like a drowning sloth, like that can't happen, can it? Um, but at the same time, so I think like in this upcoming book um, and in a lot of my nonfiction, I allowed myself that room to, to be fully myself um, and fully ridiculous. And I think it creates a lot of tension, I think, between the fact that a lot of life is like, like you know haunting and devastating and beautiful and also just funny and um you know i think the moments of humor that that happened for me always happens in moments that feel like it needs something needs release or something needs that like relief or re release um in it and i think like the i think for for me humor has a lot to do with with that and also ridiculousness too. Um, I was thinking a lot about um, 
uh, like just recently I was, uh, you know, working on, or I wrote an essay called Root Canal Street, which is a hilarious, I think, title because it's, you know, about like illegal dental care in New York City, but it's like on Canal Street, New York City. So it's Root Canal Street and it's such a, such a corny title. But I, lo I love that I could do that because I, I don't think before many years ago, I would have allowed myself to even do that because it was so serious, a serious topic that needed research. Um, so, and in that essay, I actually say, um, and there's a line that says, I'm Jane Wong, motherfuckers. And I would have never written that like before. And I don't know, I think that, having more of myself in the work itself, I think over time is something that I'm like, you know, as I get older, I give less like fucks. Like I just don't care anymore. So I'm going to just be funny if I'm this way in real life, why the hell, you know, am I not this in the, in the piece? Um, so hopefully that answers the question. I'm curious how you feel about that, like humor and tonal shift and um, moments in which there, that tension is created or, or just to do it just because it, it just feels good, to be honest. It just also feels good to, to make a, a joke um, in a poem. Yeah, I feel like everything you're saying is pretty much how I think of it. I think it's, I, I am, you know, I can be funny in real life. And I also think like what you're talking about, like sometimes there does need to be this release. And I also think I mean, sometimes I even hesitate to call, like phrase it like, how do you think about humor in your poems? Because it's, it's something that just, it happens. And so you often have to think about what you're going to do with it, like you're saying. And I think humor can feel like a release and it can feel like releasing the tension. And I think sometimes I feel like it increases it. Like sometimes I feel like, like, like sometimes people would come up to me after I read and I'm, you know, and I, I want to be, I'm not trying to like um, critique what they said to me or like suggest that like they're wrong for thinking this, but sometimes they would be like, you're like so intense. Like your poems are really intense. And I, I just would think it was so interesting because like, <laughs> Like conversationally, I don't think I um, am like an intimidating person, but I think sometimes when I read my poems, people are like, what the fuck? <laughs> and so sometimes the humor, I feel like I'm almost like leaning into that a little bit. Like I'm gonna read this really intense stuff and I'm also gonna like, it almost feels like like leering or le witchy leering, but at other times I feel like I'm trying to like also just be myself and I get to be myself in poetry more than anywhere else. I like teach myself to be myself in my poetry. And so I, I want those things to happen in there if they can. It's, I feel like the humor stuff kind of, I never know when it's gonna happen and I'm always so excited when it does. Um, and so interested in how people react to it. And I think that's why I also wanted to ask you about it because I feel like it's such a, we like need humor so much and it also like is a it can feel uncomfortable sometimes as often as it is like helpful and kind of helps people come along with you at the same time yeah no i i i love what you said about how you go to the poem to help you see yourself or understand yourself or be yourself um better or I the word I, I don't know if it's better or or but something to that effect right to see mm -hmm. yourself as you are um and yeah I think humor can intensify the um the tension for sure I think of like someone like Hannah Gadsby who proved that in her first stand-up special mm. of you know she 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 pulled the tension so tight and said I'm done I'm not doing this anymore I'm mm -hmm. not going to use myself as um, the point of humor, and I and I don't want to be this way anymore. Like I've used it for so long as a um, as a defense mechanism. Whereas other people will use humor to remove the defense, to say you know, or to remove the kind of cover, and to say let's get closer to the subject. And that's what I think is most interesting about humor. I started teaching a class on humor studies um, last year for this reason because I thought we need it now because um, I don't know if we know how to perceive humor anymore. In many ways, I think that it, it's it's totally misunderstood in a lot of ways. Of it is either incorrectly viewed as skirting 
sincerity or it mm -hmm. is incorrectly viewed as intensifying sincerity or being a um, uh, a deflection, you know, or anyway, I, I think it, it, it's oftentimes perceived in the wrong way. And, and I think humor oftentimes when it happens is, um, when it happens right, is, is uh, a, another form of authenticity. It's, it's another form of authenticity or moving towards authenticity. Um, you know, I could talk about this all night with you all. And, and I know that um, probably there's some other people in the room who can too, and I don't want to keep everyone, but this is so great. And I love that we've recorded it. I love that people who, who couldn't be here tonight could come in and they'll be able to watch it either. I'll post it to my website and I left Tim Early's and Anne Dupont's reading up and I'll just maybe post your guys as above that one. And I'll do that for the rest of the, uh, the readings for this year, hopefully, as long as the website allows me without paying another thousand dollars to keep it or whatever it is. And then I'll post it at Facebook uh, to the Common Sense Reading Series page. So if anyone's not uh, subscribed to a Common Sense Reading Series at Facebook in the group, just go ahead and do that and it'll be there as well. Okay. But I thank you so much for taking the time tonight to be here and in this format. Um, and thank you everyone for for being here and listening to Carrie and Jane Reed is just a, a really glorious evening. And it looks like Carrie's um, putting a UPS uh, stamp so we can get- It's a UPS stamps. crop top. I, I wanted to put it in there for UPS, USPS, get UPS. a crop top. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> what is that? Okay, I'm opening it now. Uh, where are we? Oh, that is a great crop top, and it's long wow. sleeve. I can run it. I can run in it. Yeah, I mean, that is amazing. Yeah, that's I own it. A running it's, shirt. Uh, it's a wonderful shirt. <laughs> I love that it says that's like great. U.S. mail all along the sides. Yeah. Uh, I know exactly what I'm getting my mom now. Uh, <laughs> that yeah, that's perfect. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Jane. Have a great Good night, morning. everyone, and take care and be safe. And let's do this again in person uh, as soon as possible. I'd love you guys to come through Kansas City and, um, and, and read here as well, or just hang out, okay? All right. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Take care. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, see you. Good night.